Um, tonight, I have the special um, privilege of introducing our speaker, Robert Gibbs. Um, we've worked with, Bob's been in the county a number of times over the years. I've worked with him since 1994, I think. Um, and we've been great colleagues and friends over the years. Uh, Bob has a very, very special uh, niche and talent. Uh, he's a landscape architect uh, by training and a, a certified city planner, but uh, really cut his teeth in the mall development industry. And over the years has taken all of that knowledge and those tricks of the trade and helped apply those to main streets across America to help make sure that, or to help re-establish, uh, re-enliven main streets and communities uh, across the country. Bob, um, his firm, Gibbs Planning Group, as uh, Bob just told me, has uh, been, um, this is the 30th anniversary for Gibbs Planning Group, and Bob's uh, annually teaches at Harvard University and um, has been recognized as one of the most 100 influential planners uh, of this century. Uh, we're very lucky to have Bob. He's here for a few days to help us uh, analyze and look at the different CRAs. You know that we're looking at them for the codes that we're, that we're developing. Um, but we figured since we had him, we'd make sure that we could get him to give his best practices in urban retail presentation. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Uh, Bob's knowledge is, is amazing and um, his delivery is, is unique and very funny. So without further ado, if you would uh, help me uh, welcome Bob Gibbs. Good evening and thank you for coming. It's nice to be in Florida. I'm from Michigan and it's a lot colder there uh, <laughs> this time. So uh, we specialize in making cities outcompete the suburbs and either historic cities um, or uh, new town centers. And uh, our practice for, a for many years has been devoted to, I think, a, an economic sustainability for cities. I'm going to cover a lot of data. Some of it's going to be very helpful if you're a real estate developer or if you're a retail owner or just a, a, a concerned citizen. And as a part of my uh, engagement with the county, I'm offering six months of free consulting by the internet. So if you're a developer or a business owner, contact me anytime. There's my email address and I'd be more than happy to correspond with you. Uh, I travel almost every day, and uh, there's a lot of lonely times in the airports, and I love conversing back and forth with people. <laughs> um, also, uh, we have an institute, I have an institute called the Urban Retail Institute, and every day on our Facebook group, we post new research about retail and consumer trends. So if you are a Facebook uh, person, uh, the URI has free data I think you'd find very interesting. I do come from the shopping, I'm a landscape architect and worked for years doing uh, urban design for cities and switched over and, uh, to work for the Taubman company. They are a shopping mall developer, they just do shopping malls and uh, their malls are known for having the highest sales of any mall in the world. They have 25 of the most profitable, highest sales luxury malls in the world and when I went there, they knew I was a landscape architect and they put me through several years of training to make me unlearn everything I'd learned as a landscape architect. Because uh, from their world, and I understand where they're coming from, a lot of what makes for good planning hurts retail. So uh, I sort of balanced both of those worlds. For example, the first thing they told me is no trees taller than 30 inches in any of our centers because trees block signs and things like that. So I've tried to balance both of those. The uh, practice we have though is helping uh, small retailers uh, thrive in cities. And uh, having a small retail shop or even a large shop in a city is very challenging because stores have different hours, it's hard to park, uh, there's loud traffic going by, and it's very hard to make a real living in that kind of situation. And we help 
cities all over the country. We've been working with Charleston for years under Mayor Riley's uh, direction. And the mayor there uh, told me that there's lots of people living in Charleston in the historic district, but they all have to drive to the suburban mall to buy a, a pair of socks. And he said, to be really sustainable, I want you to be able to live in a walkable neighborhood and shop in a walkable neighborhood. And I want whatever brands people like to be in historic Charleston. So he went for it. And we did a lot of work for him. And he got Brooks Brothers and Saks and you know the stores people like. Apple opened there. And uh, he even got a dollar store. Because you know we said people like dollar stores. So uh, that's a new kind of thinking about sustainability. We just finished a project in California for Palm Desert. This is a very high-end area. And their problem was uh, people were shopping. It's in the desert. It's quite hot there. People were shopping on the shady side of the street. Nobody was shopping on the sunny side of the street because it was too hot. So they wanted me to figure out why nobody was shopping on the sunny side of the street. And I just you know, tell them uh, after six months of study, uh, well, it's too hot on the sunny side of the street. So <laughs> I recommended they plant trees. And they, they think I'm a genius because I told them to plant trees. Uh, I just finished a project in Fargo, North Dakota. And talk about cold. Uh, it was about 20 degrees below zero in Fargo. And uh, Fargo's an interesting place, a really thriving city. Uh, and it was so cold that I could barely walk from my hotel to the office, the city hall. I literally thought I was going to freeze to death. And uh, one day I walked through this park, running as fast as I could. And there were two elderly women sitting on a bench, having the time of their lives, laughing about something. And I don't know, you know, they're just more uh, resilient there. We work for a lot of really distressed, low-income communities. And that's the new purpose of our direction, our direction is to provide the goods and services that uh, low-income people need. Uh, we did a five-year study in South Memphis, Tennessee, for uh, there were 20,000 people in this neighborhood, South Memphis, and this is their only grocery store, and that's their only restaurant. And I think it's really unfair for people who have very low incomes and really no cars, no transportation, uh, not to be able to have the goods and services. So we've developed new methodologies of figuring out the, the incomes and to attract businesses there. A lot of our business is doing market research to figure out where to open stores. Uh, we repositioned downtown Disney. We did a lot of consulting with Disney. And we just finished a nice assignment with Hilton Island. So we get to work in really fabulous places. And uh, our job is to go in and figure out what kinds of retail will be workable and uh, what the sales will be, whom the tenants should be, and then how to plan it and lay it out so that it makes sense. Um, I'm taking my cue from the environmental movement. And uh, you know, for years, the environmentalists, the Sahara Club and all of the tree-hugging groups, uh, really wanted to preserve a lot of farmland. And they wanted to keep America very rural, uh, which is a good thing to do. But they came to realize that you can't stop suburban sprawl with zoning and legally. That there's too much pressure, there's too much growth going on. And that there has to be a better way to stop suburban sprawl than just with zoning and boundaries. And they've concluded that this growth will continue to jump the rivers and eat our farms and our open space. And uh, after a lot of brainstorming, they said the only way to stop suburban sprawl, because we're going to grow in the United States, you know, we grow 2 or 3% a year. The only way to stop suburban sprawl is with cities. And uh, instead of fighting for low density, they realize that high density in compact areas is the cure for sprawl. And people that live in cities have a smaller carbon footprint than people that live on an acre lot in suburbia. And you know it's sort of an up down, upside down way of thinking. But by promoting high density in walkable cities, that's how the environmentalists are fighting sprawl. 
And that's the way that we're approaching retail. In order to stop suburban sprawl with strip centers and uh, the shopping centers and uh, fast food restaurants that we have, and there's nothing, nothing against those. But that's the only alternative now if you want to build big retail or if you want to build uh, a popular chain. The zoning and a lot of reasons are pushing you to the suburbs and to along the highways. And I feel that walkable, sustainable cities is really where retail should locate. And historically, that's where retail was. Historically, we did a study with Dana and uh, the Treasure Coast in the 80s or 90s. Uh, and, you know, in the 1960, West, uh, West Palm Beach had 80% of all spending in the county went to West Palm Beach. You could buy groceries and cars and mattresses, and they had five and dime stores. And I feel that downtowns should return to the center of commerce. That's the real cure for stopping this endless suburban sprawl for retail. And they can't, they'll never go back to 70 or 80% of the market share. Uh, currently, they only have two or 3%. And I think we can get them up a little higher than that. And uh, in order to be sustainable as a retailer, you have to have sales of $350 a square foot per year. And that means if you're a thousand square foot store, in order to pay yourself a living wage and pay your employees a living wage and cover your advertising and rent and gas bill, you really have to sell a thousand dollars a day in merchandise, 300 days a year, 350 days a year. And most small retailers that we work with only sell about $50 a day instead of a thousand dollars a day. And most of them are just hobby retailers, or, they count, they, uh, or they're, they're pouring money into their store. So our goal is to have uh, the small retailers figure out how to get sales up to that $350 a square foot, that $1,000 a day goal. And I'll talk a lot about that today. Back in the 1940s, this is Bay City, Michigan, up in the thumb of Michigan. Back in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, this was on every main street in the country. It had a five and dime store. In the south, you have Crest. We had Kresge's, no relation. But they were dollar stores that sold things for five and 10 cents. But people loved them because they were beautiful and because they sponsored Christmas parades and such. They had uh, department stores, full-size department stores. This department store is the size of a Walmart. And they had lots of traffic. This was before the interstate freeway. So the uh, traffic went right through the main street. Usually they had 40,000 cars per day through the main street. They always had on-street parking. Uh, they didn't have street trees. They didn't have banners, street trees. They didn't have brick pavers. They didn't have cute garbage cans and all the things we do now in downtowns. They were just shopping districts. They had high sales, and it's where you went to buy anything. Uh, working with Dana on West Palm Beach, I was always puzzled, why was Clematis Street the center of retail? Why was it in Okeechobee? Because you know retail needs cars. And digging and digging, we found that Clematis Street had a bridge or a ferry crossing to uh, Palm Beach. And you know that made sense. And when we looked into when Clematis failed, uh, it failed when they moved the bridge south. So my job was to tell them why Clematis Street wasn't doing very well. And I said, well, you know, this year you moved the bridge, and, and this year it failed. Um, and you know that's why I get the big money. I figure out stuff like that. <laughs> Um, downtowns, really up until about 1965, had 80% of the market share. They weren't too beautiful when you really look closely. They had huge signage, no street trees, concrete sidewalks, and they were just selling machines. Everything you needed, you could buy in a downtown. And this was the heyday. And, uh, th this is when they had 80% or more of the market share. Uh, they had major department stores. 
This is J.L. Hudson's in Detroit. This is the second largest department store in America behind Macy's. This department store was two million square feet. That is the same as 20 Walmarts. You, know, you could put every big box retailer, Walmart, Target, Kohl's, Home Depot, all of them in this building. And back then, the word big box hadn't been invented. They were called department stores and people loved them. And they loved them uh, even though they paid very low wages and they charged full price. They didn't have many sales. Uh, people loved them because they were beautiful stores, they had beautiful service, uh, they, spot they sponsored the Christmas parade, you know, Santa Claus would come there. And these big box department stores were beloved in their communities. Today, if I went to any city in the country and said I'm gonna build a two million square foot store, I wouldn't get the word store out of my mouth before I'd be kicked out of the city. Today, Americans feel the smaller is better. And it's not, smaller is really less sustainable. These small shops in any town had higher sales when they were next to the department store. And even though the department store sold shoes and jewelry, the best place to open a shoe store was next to the front door of that department store because they brought eight to 10,000 people a day past your front door. And you could specialize as a special shoe. Now, uh, this is very radical to, to say we should have department stores back town. And my new urban friends call me Big Box Bob because I recommend that. But that's the way I feel. These department stores were beautiful. And lots of people I meet had great memories when they went to department stores. It was a treat. But they paid, they paid um, below, minimum wage hadn't been invented yet. They paid, you know, 20 cents an hour and they charged full price. But we loved them. Uh, this is a department store in Missoula, Montana, where I was working last week. And this store was 100,000 square feet and uh, had a beautiful interior. And it was the center of the downtown. You know, the best retailers and restaurants were right next to this store. 100,000 square feet is the size of a Target. It was a big box store. Uh, but when, the, when those department stores left and went to the malls, this is what happened to the downtowns. Form follows anchor. Those department stores brought 30 to 40% of all the shoppers downtown. And 30 to 40% of the sales of every little store was because of the department stores. And the single thing that killed downtowns were the loss of department stores. Because of that, <laughs> small retailers have to fight really hard. If you're, a if you're a small retailer in a city and you don't have a department store or an anchor, uh, you have to come up with gimmicks. This is my son, I went to school in Scotland and he always had long shaggy hair and he always had a beard. And he, the first time he came back, he was very well groomed with no beard and short hair. <laughs> and he said, well, dad, I like to get a haircut every week. You know, it's a new me. And uh, when I went to Scotland, I saw why he was getting a haircut every week. As a small retailer, you have to get people to do something they don't want to do. You don't have to go shopping. You have to go to work, you have to go to school, you have to take your kids to a soccer game or whatever. Shopping is a complete elective activity and really without the department stores it's hard. This is one of my favorite tricks. Uh, what I do is I apply the shopping mall tricks. I apply those tricks to downtowns. Uh, this is one of my favorite tricks. This uh, gift shop got the city to paint the crosswalks to go right to his front door. So it's brilliant. So when you cross the street, you suddenly have an urge to buy a gift or stationery. Okay? So when I worked in the mall industry, we used tricks like this to get you to shop. I learned, we used time-lapse photography, and I learned how to make you turn right, and I know how to make you turn left. I know how to make you go slow, and I know how to make you go fast. I know how to make you go into a store you don't want to go into. And we do that. You are totally manipulated, just like in the casinos. You are totally manipulated into better malls, 
And I just take that science and apply it to cities. So you can now compete the suburbs. This is the uh, Missoula, Montana building, the mercantile. It was just torn down. It was the last store was Macy's. Macy's had a department store in there. Now, when Missoula hired me, I worked with Dick, uh, Dover Cole. Uh, when Missoula hired me, they said, Bob, we know you like big boxes. And I want to tell you, nobody in Missoula likes any national chains. It cannot be a national chain. I said, that's great. I, I uh, can show you how not to have national chains. I know how to do that. Uh, and I said, what's new? And they said, well, uh, Macy's, Macy's closed last year, and everybody's really depressed and sad because we all love Macy's. And I said, you know, uh, you don't get out much, but Macy's is actually a national chain. And, uh, you know, they were shocked. They said, how can that be? We like it. Uh, that store, though, that I just showed you would fit a Kohl's or a Target or a Walmart or a Costco. That's a big box. And I challenged them in Missoula. I said, you know, if I came here and said I want to build 100,000 square foot Macy's and it weren't here, you'd say no, or a Target or a Costco. Because you'd say it's too big. You would say it's going to cause too much traffic. Uh, it's going to take business from the small retailers. They pay low wages. Uh, they, they have you know, national brands. You hear this everywhere we go. And uh, I'm not sure that's really true. And so a lot of cities now hire me uh, to write codes to stop all national chains. And I can write a code that uh, makes it hard to have national chains. In San Francisco, they have codes that only you let you have a national chain when you have 12 stores or less. And so, uh, you know, that's the code. Uh, they ha they're having a problem now because some of the stores are so successful that started with one, now they're getting 13 or 14 stores and they have to leave the neighborhood. And people are saying, let's stretch it to 14 stores or let's stretch it to 15 stores. So it's a big challenge. And um, a lot of cities now ask me to write a code prohibiting all national chains except the ones the city council likes. So, you know, they always say, uh, you know, we like Trader Joe's. That's not really a chain, wink, wink. Uh, we want our, we want Apple Computer. You know, my kids like to shop at FOA Schwartz. So literally, you know, they say all national chains except these. And then the city attorney usually says, you know, that's unconstitutional. You can't do that. Uh, Missoula in its day had 70% of the market share. Today it has 3%. And I think that's unsustainable. I think if you really want to stop sprawl, you need to dial it up. And I try to shoot for 20%. Uh, downtowns are generally thriving. But downtowns are thriving as theme parks. They are places where you go for free entertainment. You can walk around with your dog. Um, you know, if you need a scented candle, you can buy a scented candle. Or, you know, if you want to have a great cup of coffee, you can do that. But when you really need a pair of shoes or you really need uh, craftsman tools or whatever you need, most of us have to go to the mall. And that's by choice. People now want that. Uh, many cities say, I want to live downtown, but I want to do all my shopping in a mall. And I don't think that's got a long uh, future to it. Downtowns uh, have wonderful independent retailers. I love them and I, I help them one-on-one -on -one how to increase sales. I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, but everybody likes these. Everybody now wants a beautiful home and kitchen store. And, you know, they're great. But the best one, the one that everybody likes the most, is Williams-Sonoma. So everybody says, Bob, we want a store just like Williams-Sonoma, the same plates, the same dishes, the same appliances, but we just don't want the name on front of the store. If you have Williams-Sonoma, it will ruin my life. My children will become, you know, uh, you know spoiled. It will totally wreck me if I have a national chain downtown. So in Missoula, this is where they shop. This is their number one place where they go to, even though they have a lovely downtown. And I think um, we need to think about what's best for our children. Whenever I do a work on a plan, I've worked with hundreds of plans, everybody comes in and say, I like this, I don't want this, I want this, I want this. And a master plan is really for 20 or 30 years, and now it's for your children's children. And when you approach groups like the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Group, which is probably the best regional planning group in the country, when you approach them or you approach your 
county commissioners like Commissioner Smith or others, you need to not think about what you personally like. You need to think what your children and their children are going to like. And uh, a large part of that is having strong sales. The average mall right now uh, has sales of $300 a square foot per year. The average small retailer only has sales of $85 a square foot per year. I really feel like we need to make it, make it higher so they can have a sustainable uh, uh, income. The goal should be $300 a square foot, $350 a square foot, or $1,000 a day. The outlet malls have sales of $2,400 a day, um, especially because of tourists. Tourists, for some strange, we do a lot of work for theme parks. Tourists, when they go to theme parks and skiing or wherever, the first thing they do is go to an outlet mall, and they love to buy the same brands on vacation that they buy at home, so go figure. Uh, tourists love to shop. It is the number one thing they do with their time. And they spend more time shopping now than going to the beach, uh, going to the theme park, going skiing or whatever. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of it is that they can bring home a sweater or a watch or something, and every time they wear that, it reminds them of their vacation. And they're back on vacation again every time they look at that watch. And uh, they like to buy gifts, and they, uh, they now are not buying souvenirs, they're buying things they need next year. They're buying things they really, they really wear. When, ch when families go on vacation, they buy all their back to school clothes. And it's because their parents aren't working, they can spend time together as a family. This is what tourists love the most. They love the name brand, like Talbot's, uh, in a unique store. This, uh, makes, this makes their heads explode when they see this, okay? <laughs> Uh, because they really believe that that sweater at Talbot's is different than the one in their local mall. And, you know, my wife loves Talbot's, and she, I can't even, you know, I have to plan where there is no Talbot's when we go on vacation, because it'll bankrupt me. Yes, that's in Essex, Connecticut, one of the great little towns. Uh, the average Apple store does $5,000 a square foot per year. Uh, their sales are so high that when you report your sales to Wall Street for a mall, you can't include Apple. Okay, it's just too high. Uh, I worked, the mall I worked on in Palm Desert has an Apple and a Tesla, and uh, that tripled their sales, just those two stores for the entire mall. The Apple in New York City has $66,000 a square foot per year. Okay, that's extraordinary. That's like $500 an hour or something. And uh, this is in a 10,000 square foot basement with no windows. The average sales, uh, the average Taubman has sales in 950, the average resort 850, the average mall 275 and the independent retailer. My goal when I work with towns is to get the sales up to there. I really want to see the independent retailers thrive. Uh, the other challenge is in America we have too much retail. We have 20 square feet of retail compared to the other industrialized countries. We are oversaturated in retail, and it's worse than that. The suburbs have 70 square feet of retail per person, and the inner cities have three. Okay? The suburbanites are spoiled. The inner city people don't. We need to balance that out. The other challenge is, if this is the paycheck, 32% goes to housing, 25% to health, 13% food. Only 5% of your paycheck goes for restaurants, and only 4% goes for apparel. So if you're, um, if you're uh, an average family and you don't work overtime, the first thing you cut out is going out to eat or going out to uh, buy clothes. And if you're a retailer, you're going after only 4% of that paycheck. It's even less for retired people. Uh, the internet still is only 8% of sales. Everybody thinks the internet's ruining retail. It's still 8% of sales. Uh, 92 cents of every dollar is still being spent uh, online. Now, that being said, 25% of all American malls are going to close by 2030, according to Swiss credit. 25%. Uh, you had a mall close here, the West Palm Beach Mall closed and is now an outlet center. Uh, back when I worked in the mall industry back in the 90s, uh, this was our target customer. She was 30 to 45, 
uh, you're most, uh, in, you're, you make the most money, by the way, when you're 44. And you spend the most when you're 44. So what a coincidence. And uh, this was our mall customer. She was uh, you know, in her uh, late 30s, early 40s. And uh, she was a, her husband worked and she didn't. Her kids were in school. And uh, she liked to play tennis and play bridge and go to the mall. Her number one social activity was shopping. And she would go shopping with her girlfriends. Three or four would get together. And they would go to the mall. They would get all dressed up. They, this is literally what they look like. They would have the hair done. They'd put on a dress, heels, jewelry. And they would go to the mall for three hours, three times a month. It was really easy to be rich owning a mall developer. Because you, you had people that actually liked shopping. And she would go to every store. Um, yuppies loved to shop. Okay, it was so easy to sell things to yuppies. Um, they made a lot of money. Um, they were very status conscious. Um, they liked to pay two hundred dollars for jeans. You know, if they said Calvin Klein. You know, they they always wore the brands, and they liked to overspend on everything. Uh, this doesn't appeal to millennials. Millennials are very cheap. They like to pay $9 for a pair of jeans, or less if they can find them in a used store. Families are, are very stressed for time and money. Families are now just barely making it. There's two incomes, and they don't go shopping anymore for fun. Shopping to them is a chore, and they don't have much money to spend. And uh, seniors are, of course, always stressed out about money. Seniors are worrying about how long they're going to live in retirement. They're on a fixed income. So seniors are not shopping any other. They got other concerns. So we've had this convergence of all these groups now that are not shopping. And that does worry the industry considerably. Uh, millennials love hanging out uh, and using free Wi-Fi in coffee shops. Millennials are extremely cheap. They like to drive cheap cars. They like to buy secondhand clothes. Uh, they spend all their money on uh, experiences. They save up to go skiing. Uh, the average millennial goes to Europe once every two years. And uh, they want to have a good life. They want to have fun. They do not like shopping at all. Um, and they want to buy cheap things. This is, a, this is where millennials shop. This is a $12 dress. Now, the yuppies wouldn't even look at a $12 dress. They want a $200 dress with a little logo on it. Millennials hate that. Now, this dress will literally fall apart after the second washing. <laughs> but that doesn't bother them because they're, you know, they want something a little more stylish. And they love shopping on the internet. They love the internet. And um, they like brands on the internet. Whoops. They like uh, stores that look a little grungy and that have a little wear and tear. This is a brand new store, a brand new tavern built to appeal to millennials. Millennials like this kind of look. Uh, they love the experiences. They love cities. Um, they're bored to death in the suburbs. They were raised in the suburbs, and they're just bored. They like being where there's other people. They like diversity, and you know they like to be around diversity. Uh, and they like a little edginess. So, you know, this, this is exactly what they like. They hate lifestyle centers. This is, okay, very boring to them. Now, we helped invent lifestyle centers when I left the mall. This is one I actually designed in Michigan. And, uh, you know, it's great because we're doing fake, town, fake streets and everything. Uh, what I didn't realize is that these are getting so good that they're hurting downtowns. This is actually a bigger threat than malls. Because the lifestyle centers are kind of cool to the people that don't like downtowns. Makes them feel like they're downtown. There's free parking. There's no homeless people, no panhandling. They feel safe. There's security people everywhere. And it sells all their favorite brands. So this is what's uh, happening with the retail industry. They're really closing malls, and they're building places like this that offer a, an experience. Uh, they always have little squares with little activities. Uh, this is probably the best town center. It's Avalon in Atlanta, and it has housing because empty nesters now love living uh, in these mixed-use places. 
Empty nesters like living uh, where they sell their large home, downsize, and uh, where they can go downstairs and, and hang out. This has been a boom for uh, housing and a boom for office and a boom for hotels. The highest rental rate for hotels and office are now in these town centers. Uh, millennials want to live in walkable places. They, uh, they don't want to be driven everywhere. The new status symbol for a millennial is not to own a car. I have two sons that are millennials and I overhear them getting together, uh, talking to their friends, and they all brag that I don't own a car and Charlie has to own a car, they, you know, they put him down for that. Uh, they like places like Detroit, I'm from Detroit. This is really cool to millennials. You know, it's a little edgy, you have to wear a little Cavalier once in a while to be safe, and you know, they really like this. And um, you know, this is just edgy enough. My son now is buying uh, and building apartments in Detroit. Uh, they like walkable places, and uh, there's a new thing called the walk score. It's not that new, but if you have a cell phone, you can uh, put in the walk score, it's a download the app, and it'll tell you how walkable where you're standing is from one to 100. This probably has a walk score of about one. But uh, a lot of places have high walk scores, and the investors, right, the investors, I'm not criticizing this, but the investors want to only invest now where there's a walk score of 80 or higher. My son is a uh, analyst for a big REIT, a real estate investment trust where they buy real estate. His first job was to find all of the zip codes that had a walk score of 80 or higher because his company was only going to invest in high walk scores. Uh, Stuart has a walk score of 87. And we were in some beautiful places today. We're in Jensen Beach, probably has a very high walk score. Uh, Palm City probably doesn't, but I think with the plans that Treasure Coast has got uh, for Map Street and the, the plans that are there, we'll probably get a high walk score. In order to be competitive today for investors and uh, millennials and uh, everybody, they want to have a high walk score. And uh, Missoula has a walk score of 97, extremely high. Um, they're also looking for something called the X factor. And the X factor is when you have a place that you fall in love with, where you become emotionally connected to it. It's not just bricks and glass and signs. Uh, Paris has the X, the left bank has the X factor, the right bank doesn't. But the left bank is cool. People like to go there and spend two or three thousand dollars a day. You know, they wear a little beret and they, you know, they think they're uh, Parisians for a couple of days. And it's because it's loaded with the X factor. You can have the X factor with artists. This is in northern Michigan, Petoskey, Michigan. And they had an artist design this storefront. Those are cups and saucers. And you can have the X factor with old neon signs. You know, this is really an easy thing to do. Unfortunately, these are illegal in almost every city in the country except uh, Beale Street in Memphis. In Beale Street, you have to have a neon sign. It's not allowed to not have a normal sign. Uh, you get the X Factor with just really beautiful store design. You know, this is Nantucket, where people spend a ton of money to go there. And, uh, you know, that gives people an emotional connection, which translates to higher sales. You know, the store will perform better. You, of course, get the X factor with the local independent retailer. There's no substitute for that. And, you know, by far, the retailers in your small towns should be independents. Uh, this is John Cross. He owns the fish store in Charlevoix, Michigan. Everybody loves him, you know. Uh, and it helps make Charlevoix a real place. Now, it's hard to build the X factor from new, especially with a lot of today's architects and developers. Uh, this is uh, uh, in Ohio, and uh, this doesn't have the X factor, and it never, it never will. Uh, this place was greatly underperforming. A lot of our business now is to go to uh, commercial centers that are failing and to tell them why they're failing. Um, and uh, that's probably a lot of our business. Uh, this one, they wanted to know why nobody likes to shop here. Or, so, you know, I said, well, you're boring and you're ugly. And uh, after that, you're pretty good. <laughs> but it has all the same storefronts. They look like strip centers, the same color awnings. 
You know, it's just a boring place. Uh, we do fun things to get the X Factor. This is in Brooklyn uh, where they took these shipping containers, they opened up the side, drywalled them, and we put in little startup businesses. You know, every community has people that are creative that make great pillows or something, but they can't afford to sign a five-year lease. So we sign uh, seven-day leases. And, you know, for $50, you can have a store for seven days. And, some, and usually they'll say, I'll take another seven days, I'll take another seven days. A lot of them fail, but a lot of them uh, actually become real stores. And this is something you can do everywhere. You can have incubator space. This is in northern Michigan. This is a group of sheds we designed. And there's 20 little sheds here. They're 50 square feet. They don't have uh, bathrooms, though. They're not ADA compliant. Uh, they have their electricity is strong with uh, extension cords, you know, duct tape to the walls of the buildings. It breaks every code there is. But these are really thriving. And these little businesses, we have 20 of them in, around the little plaza, and this is a cool spot to go. People are driving an hour and a half to go here because they can buy things they can't buy uh, at Coles. And this is a little village of 300 people in the middle of nowhere. And you can do that with your small towns. This would be great in Jensen Beach or other places. Uh, you, of course, have the X Factor with beautiful design. We highly encourage you, if you're a public official or a developer or a retailer, to find artists and just, you know, let them do what they want to do. Let them be creative. This is in um, Cincinnati, Ohio. The city hires really, really good artists, fine artists, to paint really beautiful murals. And nothing against the murals that eight-year-olds paint on the side of your building, but this is real fine art. And that's happening in West Palm Beach, I understand. Dana said uh, people have weddings in front of this. Uh, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, they have, uh, they have podiums, little, what are they called? They put things on. Uh, uh, pedestals. They have pedestals, and they have five per block, and uh, they invite artists, sculptors, every year to put their piece up for five uh, for a year. And then, then they vote on their favorite ones and they get like a $100,000 prize. And every year they have new art on every street. It's free and people drive hours to go to Sioux Falls to see the art. Art, trans I could show you the numbers, but art really translates to more people, more people with disposable income, more people that like to shop, and it's a great way of filling your stores. Signage. It's very important to have handcrafted, high-quality signage. And uh, that tends to be a little pricey, and some cities can have a facade improvement program where you help pay for it. But if you're not a national chain, if you're not the Gap, nothing against the Gap, you shouldn't look like the Gap. If you're an independent retailer, your brand is your independent, and you have to have a storefront that looks custom-made. You have to have signs that are handcrafted. You know, handcrafted is the new buzzword. There's handcrafted coffee at Starbucks, handcrafted beer, you know, handcrafted this, handcrafted motorcycles, handcrafted cars. That's the new buzzword. But if you're an independent retailer, you have to look handcrafted. You need to have sculpture as signs. And if you do have this kind of sign, it should look handcrafted. They should be individual letters uh, pinned to the front of the store, not just something in a big neon box. Uh, this is a little steel sign in France. This is where uh, we were talking about Dana earlier. This is a little, uh, this is a sign. This is made out of steel for a women's store. And she said, well, I hired an artist. I said, I need a sign. And uh, this is what she came up with. You can only get this look with artists. And so we highly recommend that. The other thing is that uh, because we have so many two-income families, 75% of the sales now occur after five at night. People are too busy to shop during the day. And if you are a small retailer, you really have to uh, have extended hours. That's the good news. The bad news is it's impossible 
for independent retailers to have extended hours. You know, they're undercapitalized. They can't work 18 hours a day. They have a life. They can't afford to hire a manager because usually a manager steals from them. And it's very hard. If you have a town of just independent retailers, you probably will not have any shopping on the weekends and at night. That's the downside. Parking. Parking is the most misunderstood, but the single most important thing necessary to have high sales. The small retailers that we want cannot afford to advertise. Okay, they can afford to keep the lights on. And they rely totally on somebody driving by their store, first of all. They have to be on a busy street. Ideally, you need 10,000 cars per day. And they want that person to drive by. They have to have a store window that you can see from your car so that when you see something that you want to buy, when you remember it's your anniversary that night and you forgot about it, you can make a quick stop and park in front of the store. These independent retailers have to rely on traffic, visibility, and on-street parking in front of their store. It's totally essential. And uh, people want to park uh, where they can see the front door of the store from their parking space. So if you have to go around the block, people will say it's too far to park. If the whole street is full and there's no parking spaces, they will not go around the block three times looking for a space. They will just go home. So it's absolutely essential that there be on-street parking and that, except on Michigan Avenue or, or Fifth Avenue in New York, and that you can pull in and go shopping. Uh, now, it, uh, it doesn't matter how far you have to walk as long as you can see the front door. But nobody minds walking a half mile in Walmart from the parking space to the front door because they can see the front door. So that's perfectly fine to them. We estimate that every parking space if it's metered, if it has a meter on it, will turn eight to 12 times per day. And uh, you need meters in cities of over 15,000 people. You really don't need them in Jensen Beach. They would be inappropriate in Jensen Beach. And they probably will be inappropriate in Palm City on map. But maybe someday they will be necessary. So uh, if you have a meter, this space will turn eight to 12 times per day. If it turns that often, uh, it will produce $175,000 in retail sales per year per space. That's enough sales for each stall to support one store if you get the turns. So a lot of planners come to me and say, uh, Bob, we're going to remove 10 parking spaces and make the sidewalk five feet wider. Aren't we brilliant? Well, you know, 10 spaces is, is $1.75 million in sales they're taking out of those stores. Those 10 spaces will maybe put 10 stores out of business. And planners have to hear that. Uh, we're, we're wrestling that with bike lanes right now. A lot of planners, you know, will remove all the parking for a bike lane. And which is sometimes it's necessary, but you should at least realize that that's probably going to impact, uh, have an impact on sales. Uh, the reason we like meters in larger towns is that store owners feel entitled to park in front of their store. Okay? They think it's their uh, constitutional right to park in front of their store all day long. So this is the store owner of that store. And um, this is the store owner of that store, and that's the store owner of that store. I actually went there at 8 in the morning, just stood there, watched everybody park in front of their store, walk into the store, and when I asked them, well, why are you parking in front of your store? They said, well, this guy said it's good advertising. You know, I get a free billboard on the, on the street. Well, none of them really cared that there was no place for their visitors to shop. By the way, they're all complaining to the city that the city's not doing enough for them to have high sales, but it's their own fault. Uh, hairdressers are especially, and hairdressers and realtors are especially bad for parking in front of their uh, stores. Uh, even when we have meters now, uh, hairdressers have figured out that, uh, you know, you have a meter for two hours. Uh, they found out that if they put hairspray on the tire, that the, uh, the ticket person, when they chalk the tire, that the chalk will stay there just until the ticket person leaves, and then the chalk will fall off because of the, the, the uh, 
So you can never outsmart them. They're always one step ahead of you. Uh, we, we have found that uh, people like the old fashioned meters where you put in a corner, quarter and turn it, or you can use your credit card or you can use your mobile app. That that's about the IQ of the average shopper. Uh, this kind of device is great for the meter maids. It makes it easier to give tickets and collect money, but it requires that you can read direct and follow directions. And that's way beyond, uh, you know, I spent yesterday in uh, Stewart, and uh, they, which is odd, the uh, parking lots uh, charge, but the on-street spaces are free. So that, a lot of cities have that. Uh, Palm Beach had that. They asked me, you know, Palm Worth Avenue is free. The side streets they charge for. And they brought me down to figure out why nobody wants to go where they pay and why everybody wants to go why it's free. That's why uh, I get the, paid the big money. I now, I now make my clients pay me before I come down because when I tell them, they don't want to pay me. I say, everybody knows that. So, um, you know, I don't really like these. And Stuart, you do have, I think, the world's most complicated uh, machine for a private lot. I, I, uh, my wife is a PhD. She literally, you know, couldn't figure out how to do it. And once we figured it out, we had to write down our license number. So we had to go back and get the license number, go back and back and back. Yeah, yeah, we needed a small, we had to take a uh, home equity loan to pay for it. And uh, so, you know, uh, shoppers are time stressed. Time is the new luxury. And so the 20 minutes we spent there was 20 minutes less we spent shopping. And I could monetize that to a number. So. Uh, Sarasota put these in, in Sarasota, and they only lasted about five months because they had font so small that anybody over 18 couldn't read it. And they were all facing the sun, so you couldn't see them. So they took them out after six months. Uh, in the new town centers that we design, uh, we always put in parallel parking because parallel parking is more eloquent and beautiful than diagonal parking. And we always put in parking meters. The, the, the private sector puts in meters for one reason. It, in, it increases sales. They're profit driven. Now everybody hates parking meters. I hate parking meters. The only thing I hate worse is not being able to park in front of the store and having to go around the block till I run out of gas. Okay? So you give them the choice. And their trick here is that they charge a lot in the meters, but they give free parking lots a block away, and the garages are free for the first two hours. So you get a choice. You can walk a block for free, or you can pay a dollar and go right into the store. Your choice. And that's, you know, the, the, you know uh, I won't charge for this advice, but uh, your parking lots should be free and your uh, on-street parking should be charged for in a town over 15 or 20,000 people, not for small towns. Uh, the best practices, um, department stores increase retail sales by 33%. If you want a quick fix for any downtown, put in a anchor store, whatever that is. Could be a, it could be a home store, it could be a, a department store type place. Um, it could be a group of restaurants. It could be what they call a category killer, where you have five good women's stores, all independent. Or it could be five furniture stores, where you're the best place to go for furniture, or you're the best place to go for dining out, or coffee, or whatever. You can have a, a virtual department store that way. A grocery store increases sales by 25%. That's a proven fact. If you have a grocery store in your strip center, Sales go up 25%. Uh, in cities where we put, gro you know, grocery stores are going back to cities. And when they go to cities, the little shops' sales go up by 25%. Uh, if you don't have a demand for a grocery store, you can put in a public market. And public markets are like farmers' markets, but they're open seven days a week, 12 months a year. And uh, this is Pike Street Market in Seattle. Public markets sell fish 
and poultry and cheese and baked goods and meats, prepared foods. And, you know, they're, they're like grocery stores, but with lots of little vendors. This is a silver bullet if your downtown is struggling to put in a public market. And um, we're, we're doing a lot of these right now and they're really reviving downs. And the nice thing is the uh, US Department of Agriculture and usually the state departments of ag have grants to help make these happen. This is the one cure-all for cities if you want an easy one. Restaurants increase foot traffic by 5% on average. Festivals increase retail sales by 35%. So if you have an art festival or whatever, our restaurant sales go up by 35% that day. They're really great for restaurants. Parks increase retail sales by only about 2%. Uh, this is misleading because the best retailers right now want to be on parks. It helps them with their branding. It gives them a lot of traffic. So if you want to fix a commercial district, if you can put in a square or a park, you will find really great restaurants and really great shops wanting to locate on the square. And a lot of places we work, a lot of suburban places, they'll make a street with on-street parking and they'll put in a square. It almost always works. Uh, festivals decrease retail sales by 10%. They help restaurants, but they kill retailers. The worst day of your shoe store will be when you have a festival. That being said, you need festivals to bring people downtown to give it life, but it will not help the retailers, just the restaurants. Uh, restaurants increase retail sales and rents by 15%. Restaurants are really healthy, and I was, I was really impressed with the nice restaurants I saw in Stewart and in Jensen Beach today. Jensen Beach has some beautiful restaurants. Um, I, I think, uh, I think a Jensen Beach is really one of the great little villages, probably in the southeast. You know, it's a little funky, it's got a couple of tacky buildings, but some nice buildings and great restaurants, and it just has a nice laid back uh, theme to it. Uh, restaurants increase retail sales by 10%. Cinemas increase sales by 6%. I think in Stewart, the cinema, you, what's it, the Lyric? The Lyric Theater probably increases retail, is probably the Lyric is responsible for 30% of the restaurant sales. It's really a great asset to have that in your community. And I think that's one of the reasons why you have so many good restaurants there. Plus you have a lot of pretty well-heeled office workers, I think, that like to go there. Merchandise and store planning. Um, one way of getting, achieving a lot of traffic and a lot of sales is to have nice storefronts. And the number one rule for having high sales is to have storefronts that you can see through and see the merchandise. So more people will, see your, will, will go into your store if they can see in the window. And if you have tented glass or mirrored glass, uh, people just look and they see themselves and it doesn't work very well. You have to have clear glass. A lot of retailers are like Andy where they, uh, you know, Andy was a former uh, shop teacher and he, you know, he retired and he wanted to have a store. He never uh, was a retailer and Andy was in Baltimore and the city hired us because Andy and all of his neighboring stores were closing. And that's because the city uh, was gonna shut the street down for a year, uh, widen the sidewalks and remove all on street parking. And all the retailers said, you know, the wide sidewalk will be nice and the banners will be nice, but my customers can't park. So they all said they're gonna close. And uh, we helped them not do that. But we also worked one-on-one -on -one to see if we could increase the sales. Andy was closing because the city wouldn't let him have any more open signs in his window. Okay? <laughs> the city planner said, you know, six open signs are enough. And, uh, and Andy said, I gotta have one more open sign, just one more open sign, and I'll be thriving in business. He really believed that. And uh, he never uh, had gone in front of a store since he signed a lease. He went and came out of the back door. And Andy said, well, the big problem I have is at one o'clock in the afternoon, all of my customers stop coming in the door. I thrive all morning, 
And at one o'clock till four o'clock, I'm dead. And I said, okay, Andy, let's figure that out. What do you do at 12.59? And he said, well, he said, don't you know? He said, the sun gets in the west side of my building and the sun shines through the glass and I have a little uh, Pepsi cooler there and the sun overheats the Pepsi cooler, the compressor has to run all day long and it heats up my store. So he says, I close my blinds at one o'clock and that uh, stops the store from overheating. Well, Andy had never made the connection between closing his blinds at one o'clock and nobody coming into his store. Okay? And that's so typical of independent retailers. So we helped Andy, we uh, took his Pepsi machine, and uh, it was there because when the Pepsi company delivered it three years earlier, the guy had to go to a wedding, and he said, I'll come back and move it uh, where it needs to go. And Andy had been waiting three years for the company to go back and move it. He's calling him every day, and they said, we'll be in tomorrow. But you know, he was, he never thought about moving it himself. So we actually got a, uh, what do you call them, a little, a little device. And I helped him move it to the back of the store and uh, he didn't have to close his blinds anymore. Andy also had these problems with the store. Okay. So this is why I make the big money. So Andy, his glass was so dirty, his door was falling off the hinge and his door was actually a biohazard. You could see germs crawling on it. And he had dead mice in the window and stacked chairs in the corner, which made it look like he was closed, and then dead flowers. And his duct tape was holding up his window. So, and we said, Andy, let's think about this a little bit. And, uh, and uh, you know, we had 100, he said, okay, I can spend $150. So for $150, we got rid of the dead mice, we washed the window, we uh, screwed in the hinge on the door, we uh, painted the door, we put in fresh flowers there, you know, we did these little things. And then, uh, by the way, can you tell what Andy sells? He's a, he's a deli operator, he owns a deli. <laughs> True story. So uh, we said, Andy, why don't you, have you ever thought about putting a sign on your saying instead of open that you're, you're a deli? He said, that's a stupid idea. He says, I've been here for 20 years, everybody knows me. But we did the demographics and we said, Andy, 20% of the people in your neighborhood move out every year. So after five years, no one's gonna know who we are. So we got him to put a sign on his window saying deli. And uh, then the biggest trick for a restaurant is, you probably know this, uh, people don't like to go into restaurants that are empty. Uh, my wife is here when we went to Stewart. Uh, she went back through the restaurant. She said, that's empty, that's empty. They probably don't have good food. We went to the restaurant where the most people were. That was her criteria. So uh, Andy, what we did with Andy, the, the way to make your restaurant thrive is you put all the people in the window, um, especially the good looking people you put in the window. <laughs> the less good looking people you put in the back. So. That's why I, um, I always am like in the kitchen where nobody can see me. So we said, Andy, put the good looking people in the window. We got some little French uh, tables out of the basement. We put some on the sidewalk, which is even better. And his sales tripled for $150. And that's the level of tactical urbanism that stores need. They get that in the malls, but they don't get that in local places. By the way, in Missoula, everybody is very grungy looking and they hate national brands except Patagonia. They all wear Patagonia, but besides that, they hate national, and Birkenstock, they like Birkenstocks. Uh, you know, go figure. But uh, and, and we figured in Missoula that really good looking, well-dressed people will keep away the grunge people, so we had to put the good looking people in the back and then just really scuffy people in the front because it would scare away the, the uh, hippies. Um, so the nationals hire people that know how to do merchandising. They know that when you walk into a store, 90% of you turn right. In Australia, they go left, but here they go right, and they like to walk in a counterclockwise motion. They don't like to walk up and down the same aisle. They like to walk in a loop. 
They like it when the jeans are folded and the shirts are folded because it looks like they're handcrafted, like somebody is working there. When they're on a hanger, it makes them feel like they're at a discount store and they're not handcrafted. And when the jeans are sized with a big size on top and a small size on the bottom, uh, more people buy them. I don't know why, they just do. So there's all these little tricks for, that the retailers know. They actually have manuals about how to do the store. Uh, when the back wall is painted a bright color, more people go to the back of the store and sales increase in the back of the store. This is called the buy zone right here. It's between two and five feet off the floor. Now this surprised me. This is the number one spot there and there for shoes. And it was empty and I said, you know, um, um, if you put shoes there, you probably would sell a lot of them. And she said, well, I know, I put shoes there and I had to stop putting them there because I always sell out of them. <laughs> Don't you know anything? I mean, I can't, I can't order that many shoes. So, guess what I told her, you know? Uh, and I just had a shoe store tell me the other day that they stopped carrying this brand because they kept, they kept selling out of it. So they don't carry that brand anymore. I mean, some of the thinking of some of these retailers is amazing. Uh, this is called the front and center table. And it's front and center in the store. And it has the hand-folded merchandise. And, uh, you know, that's called a lifestyle prop. It's an old rusted uh, basket. That makes you feel like, you know, you're not on a national chain. So this is classic. And then the big trick is to have something on sale. Shoppers expect to see at least five things on sale when you go into a store, and they want it to be the in-season good stuff, and they want the sale spread around the store, not on the sale rack. Now, this is another guy we worked with. His name was Charlie, and he was in South Carolina, and he was there. He had been waiting all day for his first customer. He had a very slow day. And our job was to help Charlie increase his sales. And his number one problem was people would come into the store, stop here, and leave. Nobody would go through that place into the store. So our job was to figure out why nobody was going through something this wide. <laughs> so we said, you know, let's widen it a little bit. Uh, he said, my other problem is nobody buys anything off the floor. Do you have any suggestions on what I can do? <laughs> You know, that was the buy zone. The other challenge was, uh, this is a long cul-de-sac. And shoppers are not that bright, but they're bright enough to know that if they walk past the same merchandise twice, it'll be boring. So they like to walk in a loop. So, you know, we just gave him a few tips. This is how most independent retailers look. And this says that uh, whatever you, I sell is not that sanitary and it's out of date, and you can get better merchandise in a secondhand store than here. This is the first impression. And if you have a door like this, it should be clean. In fact, you should paint your front door at least once every month. And you should buy Windex, um, they sell that in most stores, and clean your window once a day. You know, Jimmy John's, the sub, do you have Jimmy John's down here? In Jimmy John's franchise agreement, the franchisee has to wash all glass surfaces five times a day. Because there's a relationship between how much the glass sparkles and how many subs they sell. It's just for good business, plus other reasons. Uh, you shouldn't have handwritten signs. You know, handwritten signs are hokey. And you shouldn't have uh, too many posters on your window. Now, it's a nice thing to advertise the Girl Scouts bake cookie sale, but it's going to put you out of business. You should know that. There's something called the eight second rule. It takes eight seconds to walk past most storefronts. People walk four feet per second. And you reach the door in four seconds, and you only have a second and a half to understand the entire window display. People don't stand and grope at window displays. They walk by, you have a split second to tell your story, and if you don't tell it, they're not gonna go into your store. Also, if you have the front doors open, you will have three times the traffic and twice the sales if your front doors are open, even in hot climates. People, it's called a threshold of resistance. 
there's a threshold that makes you resist going into the store. Also, if you have two doors and you're too lazy to lock both doors and you, have you ever been in a store where you pull on door, it's locked? That, humiliate, that humiliates people so much. They're so shaken and embarrassed that when they go into your store, they will not buy anything. Okay? It's all in your head. There's a science of a psychology of shopping. And I understand it pretty well. A lot of people understand it pretty well, but the small retailers don't. And if you manage a small town or a district, you should just hire. There's probably really great merchandisers you can hire. Uh, by the way, if you walk past the door and you don't go in, no matter how much you like that window display, you will not turn around and go back. You won't go backwards. And then if there's a piece of uh, trash on the ground or your foot gets stuck in gum, or if a loud truck goes by and distracts you, if there's a teenager loitering on the sidewalk, for any reason you get distracted seeing the window, you won't go into the store. That's why it's so easy in malls. In malls, we, we, play, we play three soundtracks at the same time to confuse you enough to get you to go into the store. And we totally manipulate you, and you can't do that in a downtown. The uh, typical store is like this. It's 20 feet wide, 60 feet deep. And the typical customer turns right when they go into the store. Most retailers make a mistake is that they fill this with sunglasses and cards. Have you been in a store that's just really, that's a pinch point. And people won't go into the store or they get stressed out. This is called the decompression zone. You have to decompress from being in a bright light with lots of noise to being in the store. It takes two steps for the average American to decompress. You can't stimulate them with more things to buy. You have to let them chill out a little minute, a little minute. And then you want the customers to walk counterclockwise and you want to push them on the outside of the wall. You put, this is the front and center table, you put your most profitable merchandise in the middle because people are going to walk past it twice. And then you put your cash register on the right side so they can go through the more profitable merchandise there. So once you buy something here, I'm going to trick you to buy something there on your way to the cash register. This is the front and center table. This is a pottery barn. They are brilliant at doing merchandising. The front and center table is front and center. It has to be changed once a week. And it always has something on sale. And it has little lifestyle components, not just things to buy. And then you can see how you designed to go right. This, these are called coarsely grained displays. You put large displays on the back of the store. And then this color red causes a chemical reaction in your brain that puts you in a slightly manic state and makes you want to buy something. It's true. It's a truth. It actually is. So if you, you, know, you go to you know, Shell Oil, McDonald's, you see a lot of retailers use that color red. It's just you can't help yourself. You, you, I, I see there's... You know, movies, people see the red and they reach for their wallet. It's just, it's just it shouldn't be legal. It's so bad. <laughs> so here's the classic front and center display. These are lifestyle props. They don't sell lobster traps here. But it makes you feel like you're uh, not being hustled, like you're in somebody's uh, shop. So those are just props. They always put something on sale. And now they use handcrafted signs to make it look like, you know, these probably come out of New York City, probably pre-written on, but it makes it feel like, you know, there's real human beings here and it makes it feel like it's a national chain. Nobody likes national chains. They like what they sell and they like the price and the service and the quality and the return policies and their hours, but except for that, they hate national chains, okay? <laughs> Trust me, I know that. We do a lot of research. So here you can see you go right, uh, this should be illegal too. Nothing against American flags, but it really makes people uh, into a condition where they have to buy something. They feel patriotic. So if you're having a slow day, you know, put up a flag. Here's the front and center table for a, a small, this is Barbara National Chain. 
This is another one of those chains everybody likes. They want to have in their downtown. And it's got the sale, hand-folded merchandise. There's a lifestyle prop. And then this is a new trick. They'll put in a poster of some really beautiful people, usually a young family, you know, children. And uh, they'll put in a poster, and it makes you feel you know, guilty or something, and it makes you want to shop. This is a classic front and center table. This is what every small retailer can do. It doesn't cost much money. And the new look in fixtures is to use a rusted cast iron pipes. So instead of the chrome pipes, you know, the, the baby, the uh, yuppies love the chrome pipes. The millennials, that's too fancy. They want a rusted or, you know, uh, aged cast iron pipe. This is the front, this is the cash register. And these are little bins that make you want to buy something. By the way, you should have nothing on that counter. That's where you write your check. So you want that blank. But in front of your counter, and you should never have a now hiring sale in your store, I mean, because it makes you think you're going to get bad service. You, know, you might as well have a sign saying, we give bad service. <laughs> Don't do it. So this is the front, and this is the little uh, cubicles. And when people get out their credit card, they get into a little mental state where, uh, I can barely do this without shaking. Uh, when they get out their card, uh, and they're buying, let's say, a $30 sweater, let's say a $100 dress or whatever. Um, they say, well, since I've got the credit card out, I might as well just buy a few extra things. So in these little bins, you want things that are $20 or less. You should be able to upsell every customer to two or three of those things. This is a spe the uh, dirtiest trick is that you, if you're a woman's store, you put things in there for men. So. <laughs> Or children, children should, that should definitely be illegal. So you put in little things for, for men so that if you're spending $150 on that little black dress, uh, if you see a pair of men's socks for $5, you can buy those and you can honestly go home and say, you know, look Fred, I bought you a pair of socks. <laughs> and oh yeah, by the way, I saved $200 uh, buying this dress. And you, you know, you won't feel that guilty about it. So. Same with children's toys. You should all do that. It's a very, very old trick. And you know, the other trick is to have man chairs. You, the men uh, will look at their watch and hover over the women. And I'm going to sound very sexist, uh, but I am. And uh, men will hover around the women and say, you know, we have to go home. And uh, so they shop a lot less. There's a, a women's lingerie store a famous one, where they found when, when women were with, their, with a man, they spent 4.5 minutes in the store. But when they were by themselves, they spent 40 minutes in the store. And, you know, you just, you have to get rid of the men. You, you, <laughs> the best way is to, you know, give them a, a manly magazine and uh, have them sit there and just, you know, get rid of them. Uh, this, lunch, this lingerie store, uh, <coughs> found the uh, only way to get rid of men was to put really racy, sexy posters of beautiful models in the windows. You probably know the story I'm talking about. And uh, they found that men feel a little uncomfortable looking or walking by those posters. So men actually walk about 20 feet away from the front of the store and they look, you know, that way. And uh, so um, that's brilliant because if, if you're shopping with a man, uh, when he gets about 20 feet from the store, he'll say, uh, go ahead and take your time. Uh, here's my credit card. I'm going to go buy some craftsman tools or something. <laughs> it's just really brilliant. The, the industry is so sick that the, uh, the new thing is called vanity sizing. And uh, they, found that, uh, they found that when their women's sales were down, because of the internet, so they cut out the size tags and sewed in new ones that were one size smaller. So if this is the, I think this is the low point of my business. So if you used to be a size six and you and you put a little weight on, uh, when you go into the store next time you'll you'll fit into a size four, and you'll feel so proud of yourself. So all oh, that diet worked, you know, um, all that workout I'm doing. I can fit in a size four. So 
I gotta give away all my clothes and just buy size fours because they're all too big for me. And so women literally call the Salvation Army, give away all their clothes, and buy everything in a size four. It is really sad, but it really works well. So um, the sad part now, if you used to be a size two, now you're a size zero. And they're having a hard time with that, but they don't care. But it's so, I mean, the, the level that they go to is unbelievable. But that's what it takes to have the high sales. So here's classic. This is, this is an uh, independent store. It has a rough, uh, rustic table. It has something on sale. It has handcrafted jeans. The jeans all have holes in them. That's what the millennials like right now. And, you know, that's the look. This is a store we consulted with in California. And this was a beautiful bakery. And uh, but she was dying. She was going to have to close. Her sales were horrible. And we were supposed to help her. Well, the one thing she did is, you can see this is the, the back of the store. And you can't see the merchandise. It's too small. And the other thing is the lighting. That kind of lighting makes you squint. It actually closes your aperture because the the glare. So you have to have lighting. This is very sophisticated lighting. And then the last thing uh, is, is you can paint your restaurant any color except blue or yellow. Okay? <laughs> blue and yellow curbs your appetite. Seriously. You'll, if you ever go in a restaurant with blue or yellow, you probably won't eat anything. So uh, the other problem was this is her bakery. And this is a bakery and Pete's Coffee next door. And she said, you know, I stand in the window and everybody goes to Pete's Coffee. They have terrible day-old rolls and cookies. No, I can't get anybody in my store. Nobody knows I'm here. So I said, okay, let's see why nobody knows you're there. <laughs> so let me go home and think about it. I'll send you a letter after you pay me. <laughs> right? Can you figure out why nobody knows she's there? And she has no sign, of course. And uh, she said, well, I spent so much money uh, on my store interior that I thought I'd wait a year and then buy a sign. <coughs> well, she won't last a year. So this is the uh, painting your shelves black and lighting them well will have merchandise jump off your shelves. It's an old trick. Uh, shoppers are time stress. Uh, time is the new luxury. I sat next, in, uh, on the way down here, I sat next to a fast food restaurant uh, president. And he said, uh, you know, we don't sell, uh, I'm not going to tell you what he sells, but we don't sell, you know, uh, our food, we sell time. So you can come to my restaurant with your two screaming kids, and I can get you out of there in 10 minutes. And then you can go home and have a little time. We sell time. Time is the new luxury. Same thing with shopping. Uh, people, uh, this store ha has a thousand different handbags. It's the best handbag store in this city. But she realized that women would go and they'd see all these handbags and they would get uh, stressed out. They would be overwhelmed and they couldn't make up their mind. So this store owner picks out her favorite nine and every week she changes it. Changes it. There's a little card that says, you know, my, Betty's favorite purse of the week. And you do the shopping for your customer. You take it from a thousand to nine. And if you sell wine, if you're going to a wine shop and, you know, I, I feel like a complete loser going in a wine shop. I don't know, you know, anything about wine. But when they set out a bottle of wine and say, this is good with poultry, this is good with chicken, uh, you know, or poultry and chicken, same thing, isn't it? <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> you know, this is good with beef, whatever. Um, you know, that helps me. And they'll say, you know, this is uh, dry wine. Everybody likes dry wine, by the way. Uh, I like to... Uh, see the face of my waiters when I say, I like really uh, sweet and uh, fruity wine. Do you have anything like that? And they just like throw me out of the restaurant. Um, but you have to make it easier for people to shop. You have to do the shopping for them. You're, if, you're, uh, if you sell furniture, you need to look like a home. Because it makes people relate to what's this going to look like in their home. Isn't it beautiful? It's also good to have incandescent lights. Um, the LEDs produce good light but they uh, stress people out. So if you have a store, it's good to have eight or 10 incandescent lights in a shade. It's really nice to have a beautiful storefront and with going down on the sides. And uh, Andreas Dewani taught me this, but dark gloss colors 
work the best. Black, dark green, dark blue, dark red, dark gray, they produce higher sales. Uh, if your store window looks like this, there's a couple of issues with it, but the biggest is this is what you see in strip centers along the highway. This is the aluminum <coughs> storefronts that every strip center has. And if you are a, not a chain, if you're the best handbag store, the best shoe store in the region, you don't want to look like a chain. You want to look like a handcrafted specialty retailer, and that includes a handcrafted storefront, like this. This says that this jewelry is very special. It's not a, something you buy in a mall. And by the way, it's good to put the brands that you sell, because remember, tourists love to buy brands. Okay? They love, you know, they know these brands. So it's good to advertise that. This is a home run to have an independent retailer with brands. Look at what this is a little alley in Provence. Look at the, the, this was an artist that designed this. These are barn doors. They open them in the day, they close them at night. Doesn't that look inviting? It's beautiful. Uh, this is the basic rules. This is what I was doing in Mexico, so everything's in meters. But here's the basic rules. You should have a bulkhead at least eight, uh, 18 inches max. You should have a sign band, 18 inches max. Uh, you should have at least 60% glass, and it should be clear glass. This is called the, uh, this is another decompression zone. You need about three feet of rest between each storefront. Okay, it, it, you will get confused. So, you know, one or two steps between storefronts. And then this is a nice black, uh, a black sign. By the way, the sign band's job isn't really for the sign. The sign band's job is to make you look here so that your eyes don't look up. It actually stops your eye from meandering. Remember, you want every second on the merchandise. You don't want people to study the building upstairs. So here's a very beautiful dark painted glass. It has the sign on an awning, clear glass. This looks like a specialty store, even though it's a chain. Uh, we put awnings on storefronts for two reasons. Uh, it provides shade so that you don't have to close your blinds. This is a great invention they discovered around uh, 400 AD. <laughs> <laughs> awnings, make, you don't have to have tinted glass. Now, uh, I was in a city, I was in two places today, and where all the retailers had tinted glass. And you can't see into them. That hurts sales directly. So the awnings, besides giving you shade, look at the shade, besides giving shade, uh, people, we found people like walking underneath things. You know, that goes back to the Neanderthal days. You would be less likely to be eaten by uh, whatever uh, if you're in the shade underneath the tree. If you walk through the open meadow, you're vulnerable. So people like to walk underneath canopies. That's why we really use awnings. It puts them up to the window and it puts them up to the door. So it's just a very old trick. By the way, if you ever repeat any of these, I'm going to deny, and I'm gonna burn the tape. <coughs> this is a great little olive store, olive oil. There's the sign band, stopping you from looking upstairs. Just a very beautiful, well done store. Uh, this is a smart store. Nice awning, the letters in the front, we like the letters to be no more than three or four inches high clear glass, a beautiful building, and beautiful light. Uh, you should, if you're a retailer, you should keep your lights on until 11 o'clock at night, the store window lights. It provides nice ambiance on the sidewalk, and it's free advertising. So even if you close at five, uh, people will go by and see your store. In shopping uh, down in uh, lifestyle centers, we put all the store windows on one circuit. So the mall manager keeps them on till midnight. We control them. Urban design, uh, it's very important to have a square or a plaza in your downtown. I can't overemphasize how important it is. If you want to revitalize a, a street, uh, put in a square. You know, it's like when your feet are cold, you put on a hat, same thing. And uh, the square will bring people there on a regular basis. Uh, they will be relaxed, they'll go to coffee shops, families will come there and it really will help with retail and restaurant sales. Uh, the squares should be small. I like them best when they have a little bit of grass in them, when they're not all 
paved, and they should have shade trees. Um, this is Worth Avenue, and uh, I have found that the most luxurious shopping streets in the world just use concrete sidewalks and grass. They're very simple. Uh, but the, the concrete is power washed every week, and it had a landscape architect design. It's beautiful saw cut joints. You know, it's very beautiful concrete. It's tooled to a nice finish. And uh, this is from Third uh, Street in Naples, Florida. You know, just a beautiful little district. Uh, when do, uh, store owners should have flower boxes. This is very simple. <coughs> you have flower boxes in front of your store. Um, a lot of downtowns I work with, a lot of business improvement districts, uh, pay and install the boxes, put in the flowers, water them. They put in different plants so it doesn't look like it's central management. But this really gives you that X factor and will translate to more people coming to your downtown and higher retail sales. This is essential for uh, cities. Now, we work in a lot of cities that have a lot of challenges. And uh, in a lot of the cities, especially university towns, uh, these flower boxes get vandalized. You know, they knock them over, they pull the flowers out, they put things in the boxes. And uh, if that's the case, then you have to fight back. And uh, you have to, every morning, have a, have a gardener come in and replant the flowers. You can't let the vandals win. And many cities we work in look horrible because people gave up on planting flowers. And the vandals are winning. If you want to be a real competitive district, even if you have to hire a gardener every morning, you have to have lots of fresh flowers. Uh, street trees increase retail sales by 12 to 20 percent. And there's, uh, it also creates the elasticity of price. Uh, when people go to any downtown, they believe that they're going to pay 10 to 30 percent more for the same item as they would in the mall. It's not true. But people always think downtowns are more expensive than shopping centers. And if you have beautiful landscaping and beautiful trees, then people will feel like they're getting a better value. It's called the elasticity of the price point. And so if it's really beautiful, uh, people will feel like they're getting val better value and they will stay there longer. Now, a lot of cities I work in, a lot of retailers feel if they look too good, people will think they're expensive. That's like that shoe store that doesn't put a shoe in the front because it keeps selling out. Okay, you can never look too good. Don't think you have to look run down to have people think you're giving a little price. It's just the opposite. If you look run down, uh, people will think you're overcharging. Uh, be careful where you put street trees. You should never plant crepe myrtles in downtowns. And I'll go on the record for saying that. You know, crepe myrtles are really great in my grandma's backyard, but they don't belong in front of store windows. Look at how that blocks the sign. That tree, as nice as it is, is hurting that business. Um, we think you should have street trees, large street trees. Um, or, uh, Jensen Beach has nice, they uh, look like live oaks, beautiful trees. Uh, Delray Beach, we just did a long study in Delray Beach, has beautiful, beautiful shade trees. Um, uh, but the trees should be located where they don't block signs. Okay, they, this tree should have been located here, blocking the, the electric meters rather than the signs. So what that means is trees have to be planted asymmetrically. In other words, you have to use common sense. You can't just look on the plan and say every 27 and a half feet we're going to put a tree. You actually have to go out, like with Andy, and look at the store and say, okay, we're going to put a tree there, and we're going to put a tree there, and we're going to leave the sign open. You just have to use basic common sense. Um, I don't have a picture of Worth Avenue, but actually they did uh, put a lot of trees right in front of the uh, door, the signs and doors, and I showed them some of those, and uh, they actually moved them. And I went back. You know, it's just a simple thing you can do. The next trends, uh, the big next trend is, uh, you're not going to like this, but the national retailers are leaving the malls, and they're going to cities. They're following their customers. 
So William Sonoma uh, is leaving the mall. Many of the national retailers are finding rents are too high and they can have better sales. This isn't the case everywhere. Uh, Palm, the, the Gardens Mall is one of the best malls in the country. Um, I forget the name of the mall in Martin. Treasure Coast, one of the great malls in the country, Treasure Coast. So if you have good performing malls like that, they're gonna stay there. But uh, a lot of retailers are going to Main Street, this is Winter Park, and they're going there because they have higher profits. Rents are a little less, sales are high, and their customers, many customers prefer shopping on Main Street. Look at this, this is a Williams Sonoma. This is the new thing. They will build three and two and four story stores. They will break all their rules. They will use the basement and they want the stores to look really beautiful. This helps you believe that uh, you're, you know, which is true here with William Sonoma, you're getting really beautiful merchandise, you're getting really good service. And the urbanism helps print their brand. It's where the customers are going. So all the chains, a lot of the chains are going into cities. Now, I put this up because a lot of these stores are not going into cities, but I put this up. These are the stores that every city tells me they want, uh, especially the cities that hate chains. Um, the people that say, you know, like in Missoula, they hate chains, but they all like Birkenstocks and um, Patagonia. Uh, every city says, I hate chains, but if you can give me a Trader Joe's, a Whole Foods, an Apple, a Duluth, Williams-Sonoma, Anthropology, and Cabela's, then uh, we'll give you a bonus. So go figure. Um, these stores are home furnishing stores. And you're never gonna get a department store back downtown probably again. But you can have, a, they don't have to be national chains at all. You can have a collection of eight or 10 really beautiful home stores. P pillows, lamps, furnishings, you know, accessories, frames. And just by having what, what they call a category killer, just having the best selection in the region for home furnishings or women's apparel or restaurants or toys for children or books, you can create a draw to pe bring people downtown and they should not, they don't have to be changed by any means. Uh, if you can have an apple, you know, it's great, but most times you can't get an apple. Apple's very fussy where they go. Uh, in Charleston though, they did get the Apple store on King Street. And Charleston has three really good malls with free parking. And Apple said, no, we're gonna go on King Street. They didn't say this, but the reason was they have higher sales. Now, that's the point I'd like to get to. I'd like to get to a point where the best retailers go to cities so you can have more market share to stop suburban sprawl. Just like the environmentalists, if you really wanna stop sprawl and you wanna make your cities sustainable, why not be able to live in, you know, I've seen beautiful neighborhoods here, why not live in a nice neighborhood and be able to walk to Trader Joe's? Why get in the car and drive out to the mall? So it's something I want you to ponder. Uh, this is a beautiful little town in California. Uh, what's it, Carmel by the Sea. And I show this picture, everybody loves it. They say, I wanna live there. But when I show this picture, they say, oh, I, that's the worst place in the world. If I live there, I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown and you know, it's gonna ruin my life and I'm, you know, just because of that one sign. And I really wanna challenge that thinking. This is Savannah, the best probably historic district in the country. And this is actually the store. I photoshopped that on. And when I show this, everybody says, I love this store, but I hate this store. Okay, those words really make my skin crawl. And I really want you to, I really want to challenge you about that thinking. Um, does that really bother you? And, and I'm not exaggerating, many, many people say I'm going to ruin their life and I'm going to ruin their city by having those words on that store. It's very common. This is in Charleston. This is a Banana Republic. Banana Republic loves cities. Uh, this, they love buildings that look old and worn in. This is the new look. Um, Walmart is uh, pretty well saturated in the suburbs. And so this is, Wal this is Walmart's growth model. They're going urban. They're building three and four story small stores 
in cities. You know those cities that I showed earlier that have three square feet of retail per person? Those people that have low incomes, many of them are having to take a bus to go out where they can afford to buy groceries. And so Walmart has realized, and many retailers have realized the growth this year. Now, on, they've changed their model. They're completely willing to go urban. The problem is that there are no cities in America that want them. Every city says, go out in the highway. I don't want you downtown because you'll ruin my life. Uh, Target is going very urban. They're called city targets. And uh, the new thing is they don't put their name on them. They just put it in the circle because then you won't think it's a national chain. And uh, Target loves cities. This is their growth. The suburbs are saturated. The cities are on, under retail. These, this is a three-story Target in Philadelphia, and it's only 20% of the size of their suburban stores. These really, really do well. They offer food and snacks and electronics, everything that you would want. And some cities really want Targets. Some cities don't. Most cities say, uh, I hate Walmart, but I want Target. I hear that all the time. And you know, that's a value you have to have. Uh, this is a, the old sample. Here's a crate and barrel. This is a 80,000 square foot store, big box. It's in, uh, it's in Massachusetts. And uh, these little home stores benefited from crate and barrel. Crate and Barrel will spend 20,000, or a store like Crate and Barrel, I don't know their budget, but a store like Crate and Barrel will spend $20,000 a week on advertising. It brings thousands of people to the store. They go there to buy wine glasses and couches and you know home goods. And the best place to have a, a wine glass store is right next to Crate and Barrel, because they're bringing thousands of people that want to buy wine glasses. And so they don't always like everything in that store. They want more selection. So this is supporting a wine store, a home furnishing store, a houseware store. All of these little shops benefit because of that anchor. And I say if you really want to have the small retailers, you have to have a balance between the anchor type stores and the others. Now as a city, you should require that Crate and Barrel be a good citizen that it be built up to the sidewalk, that the parking be in the back, that it have large clear glass windows, et cetera, et cetera. And I, it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter to you whether that store is 10,000 feet or 100,000 feet. Size is the least important uh, factor, I think, in a store. I think it's the urbanism that counts. In fact, I could show you with models that the bigger the store, the more to help the local retailers. This is a home run as far as I'm concerned. This is in Petoskey, Michigan, where I get to spend my summers. And it's just a great little store. It's got all the right elements. It's painted dark gloss color. It's got the flower box. It's got that uh, invention called an awning, which you know in the afternoon you can roll out. It shades the window. And it's just got everything. And it's a local retail, a local bookstore. By the way, local bookstores are thriving right now. Uh, they're really doing well. Uh, even Amazon has realized that now Amazon is opening dozens and dozens of small bookstores in cities. They're, they've gone back to cities. They found that um, their people like to, a lot of their customers like to uh, touch the book and look at it before they buy it. So uh, this is me, Gibbs Planning Group. Uh, this is my email. I am very sincere. If you're a resident, a retailer, or a developer, a policymaker, you are more than welcome to really email me anytime. Send me a picture of your store, send me a picture of your main street, uh, whatever you want. I am more than happy to help you. Uh, it's been a great privilege working with Treasure Coast and Commissioner Smith. We saw uh, Palm City and Jensen Beach today and Golden Gate. Tomorrow we're seeing Port, Port Bryant, yeah, Ryle, which I say real. It's, you guys mispronounce it. It's supposed to be real, by the way. Uh, so, you know, it's really great to be here. And, uh, you know, we're looking at little things that can be done to help these little, your small businesses expand, but also to make your neighborhoods sustainable. I really think that you, uh, you have to be able to ride your bike or walk to a lot of your goods. You shouldn't have to always go to the mall. This is my book called Urban Retail. 
where everything I told you for free, you can pay a lot of money for and buy the book if you want to, if you, you, know, if you want to read it again. Uh, I teach a class at Harvard. This is my 22nd year teaching class at Harvard. It's just a three-day class. And this is Harvard's longest running and most popular uh, executive edge class, yeah. I tell the same stories, the same jokes for 22 years. I still get away with it. And uh, some people are on their third time. So, uh, you know, this is open. It's open enrollment if you're interested in it. It's a great class. You get a really nice certificate from Harvard that you can frame, and uh, it'll help you. So thank you very, very much. It's really nice to be back here. Thank you.